This place gets raggedier by the minute. Welcome back to Wine and Chill. I'm Stephanie, your favorite recovering lawyer, and today we're finally going to discuss Roe v. Wade. And because it's Monday, we're having a little water and chill. So for a few weeks, I promised y'all that we would do a deep dive into Roe v. Wade, the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the new case, which is Dobbs v. Jackson. Are you ever in a situation where you know something bad is going to happen? You're prepared for it, you think, and then it happens, and, um... You're a little taken aback. Yeah, that was me with Roe v. Wade. And I think that was a lot of people. I knew it was going to happen. And yet, whew, it's been a lot. It's been a trying couple of weeks. But we're here. And I figured since so much has been said about Dobbs v. Jackson, which is the Supreme Court case which overturned Roe v. Wade a few weeks ago, I figured we would actually take this back and do a little historical look back on how the hell did we get here? And what were the real lawsuits that actually mobilized the religious right? There's a little disinformation, a little erasure going on. Let's start first with the original case. The original case of Roe v. Wade was decided by the Supreme Court in 1973. It was a class action lawsuit brought by Jane Roe, who her real name was Norma McCorvey. Norma McCorvey was a poor Texas woman. Emphasis on her class status, which is going to come up throughout this video and I forgot to mention this will be a part one of a part two and definitely come up in part two. Prior to Roe v. Wade in 1973 throughout the United States were illegal. That does not mean they were not happening. They were. People that could afford to have abortions were having safer which I'm probably going to have to bleep out the word. I'll bleep it out from there and I'm just going to censor myself moving forward. Norma McCorvey at the time could not afford the procedure. After Roe v. Wade was decided, she became the central figure and unintentionally on her end and very intentionally by the lawyers that took on her case, they kind of made her the figurehead for the women's rights movement around Roe v. Wade, which I have some thoughts. So specifically, Norma McCorvey gave birth twice previously. Both of her children she gave up for adoption because she could not afford to take care of them. Her first child she had when she was 16 years old. Norma's story almost 50 years later still rings true. The number one response given by people who are seeking this procedure is because they cannot afford to raise the child. Now before you jump the gun and say that you're going to adopt said child, we'll discuss that misguided um, lie. At the end, Norma McCorvey in 1973 told the Southern Baptist Convention News Service, now remember the Southern Baptist Convention? We're going to bring them up again in a little bit. I was a woman alone with no place to go and no job. No one wanted to hire a pregnant woman. I felt there was no one in the world who could help me. Now, one of the sadnesses of Norma's case is that the lawyers that approached her did so most likely knowing that she would not receive the services before the case was decided. Essentially, no knowing that by making her the figurehead behind this case, she would be forced to carry the pregnancy to term. You know what? I've said this a million times. People in my profession, sometimes the scruples are lacking. Once Roe was finally decided, she had long been forced to give birth and put the child up for adoption. The key tenet in the majority ruling of Roe v. Wade was that the court applied the strict scrutiny test by creating the three trimester standard. Not to be confused with what normal people know as trimesters during birth, this is different. Trimesters just means three, so they use that word and kind of ran with it. It's a little convoluted, but anyways. The first trimester, the decision to terminate the pregnancy was solely at the discretion of the person who was pregnant. So the first trimester coincided with this concept also of viability, which we'll get to in a second. After the first trimester, the state could regulate procedure during the second trimester. The state could regulate but not outlaw procedures in the interest of the mother's health. The original ruling, Roe v. Wade, despite its flaws, which we will talk about in a bit, did center everything around the pregnant person, as it should. After the second trimester, the fetus became viable, so introducing the viability, and the state could regulate or outlaw the procedure in the interest of the potential life, except when necessary to preserve the life or health of the person. Casey v. Planned Parenthood then, almost 20 years later, in 1992, essentially took the teeth out of Roe v. Wade. And it's important to note that Roe v. Wade, when it was decided, 
could have been based on other legal doctrine, but for some reason, the courts chose the privacy clause that was implied in the due process clause, which is the 14th Amendment. Which, if that just sounds like a bunch of unnecessary clauses, we'll go through them right now. The 14th Amendment, which Roe v. Wade was based on, was introduced in 1868, an amendment to the Constitution, which essentially granted equal rights to formerly enslaved Black Americans. The 14th Amendment... <sighs> As you can see, we are still fighting for the actual ratification of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was supposed to grant citizenship and equal and civil rights to black people. However, it wasn't until 1964, literally 104 years later after the 14th Amendment, that black people actually gained the right to vote in this country. So that's just a precursor for you. The 14th Amendment has um, not always been followed. So, but the court decided to base Roe v. Wade on the 14th Amendment. Specifically, the 14th Amendment states all persons born or naturalized, at that point, Black Americans were considered naturalized citizens because they were not originally considered citizens, even though, you know what, we won't get into that side tangent right now, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So first and foremost, KCV Planned Parenthood did away with Roe v. Wade's strict scrutiny test, specifically that three trimester test, KCV Planned Parenthood allowed states to then intervene in the first trimester of pregnancy and allow states to make laws that restricted the procedure. Casey then implemented the undue burden standard, which was that states, yes, they could restrict the procedure, but they could not cause an undue burden. The purpose or effect of placing substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking a procedure of a non-viable fetus. Now, viability has been argued over and over and over again so we're not going to get into that because there is a lot of misinformation disinformation a lot of people thinking that they have mds as to what viability actually means if it cannot survive outside of another human being it is not viable there you have the two original cases. You can't discuss Roe v. Wade without KCV Planned Parenthood. People still will refer to the right to the procedure as Roe v. Wade, even though, oh, gosh, 30 years ago, KCV Planned Parenthood definitely changed most of it. KCV Planned Parenthood, I would say, is not as well known as Roe v. Wade since it is the case that came afterwards. Dobbs v. Jackson overturned Roe v. Wade fully and essentially overturned what Casey had left of Roe v. Wade. While we are going to focus on the history of how we even got to Dobbs v. Jackson and why certain religious groups have really rallied around limiting health care, which is essentially what this is, I would be remiss to not do a small section of the call-outs of Clarence Thomas's call-outs in his majority opinion. It should be noted first and foremost that Clarence Thomas alone did not write the opinion, although it is his majority opinion, that Clarence Thomas alone is not solely responsible, although he decided to make himself the face of foolery. What Dobbs v. Jackson did is overturn Roe v. Wade and KCV Planned Parenthood and essentially say there is no federal right to the procedure. The states can do whatever they will. The states know best what people in their state need, which is the biggest load of malarkey and nonsense because we see who is running some of these states when we're going to specifically get into the nonsense of specific states in part two, but a little bit right now in part one. In his majority opinion, he stated, and quote, for that reason, in future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. I feel like I'm saying Obergefell wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong, I'm practicing it. Back to the 14th Amendment due process clause, which is the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and recent times included in that is the implied right of privacy. All of the cases that he listed as precedent were built on the implied right of privacy that is in the due process clause. As in, as a person, I have the right to privacy to do what I want. It's none of your business if I'm taking birth control. Mind the business that pays you, and trust me, it's not me. 
I'm broke. So those specific cases that Clarence Thomas called out are 1965 Griswold v. Connecticut. Griswold v. Connecticut was a landmark Supreme Court case which ruled that married couples were allowed to purchase contraceptives and or birth control. And it's interesting that the case is specifically for married couples. It wasn't until years later that single women were allowed to purchase their own birth control. This is 1965. It's not that long ago. 2003's Lawrence v. Texas, which that law stated that neither men nor women, regardless of who the other consenting adult was, whatever their sex was, was allowed to participate in anal sex. And that was ruled unconstitutional in Lawrence v. Texas. And literally just the other day, in 2015, the United States finally decided to join the rest of the sensible world and allow for gay marriage in the 2015 landmark Obergefell case. By Clarence Thomas specifically calling out these cases, he is letting everyone know the majority conservative Supreme Court is going to be looking at those cases. This place gets raggedier by the minute. In the recent news and the news for the past 20 years, there has been a lot of fanfare around the alleged pro-life movement. And I am a big fan of the idea that language matters. The language you use can dictate, create, as well as shape the current reality. Calling these people who are essentially forced birth advocates pro-lifers is incorrect. Pro-life would mean you want to fund the school system. Pro-life would mean you care about foster kids. Pro-life would mean anti-death penalty. Pro-life would mean a lot of things. In part two, we'll discuss how the U.S. has privatized CPS, Child Protective Services, and is essentially making money off of child abuse has continuously been caught in racketeering schemes of juvenile centers, aka child prisons, how predominantly anti-abortion states have defunded education as well in their state. And honestly, this list of how America and forced birth advocates don't care about actual children is very long. But for now, let's focus on the history and specifically the court cases behind the forced birth movement under the guise of the cute name pro-life, but actually more sinisterly and more truthfully is all about segregation. And like everything in America, of course it has to do with race. So prior to Roe v. Wade in 1973, the forced birth movement was mostly individual people and small Catholic groups. Catholics in the U.S. have a political history of advocating in their respective states against However, 1973's Roe v. Wade seemingly gave people a catalyst, a federal boogeyman to rally behind. However, that's not exactly true. And the group most often cited as anti advocates are the evangelical right-wing Christians. Now, let's set the stage for a second historically. It's 1973. Nixon is um, in hot water. This little thing called Watergate, the man got impeached, the man resigned. It was a commotion. The GOP is in shambles. What is a Republican to do if they need new votes, new fresh votes. Well, the way that the history has been stated, it seems like the GOP was always anti Ah, eh, that's not true. Anti did not get added onto the Republican convention until 1976, three years after Roe v. Wade. Hmm. And in 1979, Republicans enlisted hand in hand the evangelical voting bloc, which was basically the majority of the white South. Getting the evangelicals who were ardently anti-big government wasn't an easy feat for the basically disgraced GOP. They needed to get the evangelicals to rally behind something. Now, remember back to when I mentioned that Norma McCorvey, the woman behind Roe v. Wade, that she spoke at the Southern Baptist Convention on their show, specifically stating that she was poor and indigent, which is why she could not afford a child. That same Southern Baptist Convention, which is a large convention of evangelicals, in their 1971 and 1974 meetings, they noted as resolutions that the topic of the procedure was a political issue and a private issue of the family and that the church should not intervene. They weren't particularly interested in the cause. 
They didn't particularly care about the fetuses back then. That changed because of another landmark court case almost 20 years prior, Brown versus Board of Education. So Brown versus Board of Education most famously desegregated the schools in America. Prior to that, all of the schools were segregated, black children in the dilapidated underfunded schools and white children in the much nicer schools. It should be noted outside of all of these jarring pictures of white families yelling at young black children that most Southern states and most Southern counties refused to integrate for years, decades. It went so far that in Virginia, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, North Carolina, Texas, and South Carolina, they decided they weren't gonna do it. They simply were gonna create segregation academies. So instead of integrating, these evangelical churches decided, Ah, to heck with that. We're not going to school with them black kids. We will create our own school and essentially made the tuition so low that every white child could afford to attend, but they wouldn't admit any black children. A big reason why they were able to afford these private yet free white only segregated academies is because they received tax free funding. Yes, these evangelical churches had 501c3 status, aka everything was tax exempt. They created the schools and thus they created the schools with the same 501c3 tax exempt status. Mm hmm. So between 1954 and 1973-ish on the books, hundreds of segregation academies popped up throughout the United States. So one of the states mentioned was South Carolina. In doing my research in the case that led to this, I was talking to my boyfriend and he immediately mentioned Bob Jones University. If you're not blessed to know someone from Greenville, South Carolina, don't worry, I'll enlighten you. Bob Jones University is a private, non-denominational evangelical university in Greenville, South Carolina. It's known for its conservative culture and religious positions. In Bob Jones University own words, You'll broaden your horizons through liberal arts and fine arts while learning to view everything through the lens of a biblical worldview. That doesn't sound dangerous at all. You'll develop your talent and skills, not just for yourself, but for something bigger, and you'll be a part of a vibrant community of believers growing in Christ and then going out to serve him. I would like to know a vibrant community of white believers and white believers specifically because Bob Jones was founded by the ardent segregationist Bob Jones. The man clearly loved himself. He named the school after himself. Bob Jones loved segregation so much, he broadcasted an Easter sermon on the radio on his belief that segregation was scriptural. <sighs> on to the case that haunted Mr. Bob Jones for the rest of his days. Green v. Connolly. So, as these segregation academies were popping up all over the South, a group of black parents in Mississippi decided they had enough. They sued the Secretary of the Treasury because the Treasury runs the IRS. And the IRS is who gives you tax exempt status. Under their lawsuit, they specifically cited that the IRS was unconstitutionally allowing these segregation academies to claim 501c3 tax exempt status. And this was a constitutional issue because the schools essentially were just doing this to get free money and to skirt Brown v. Board of Education. At the time, Brown v. Board of Education only applied to public schools. So the IRS then decided that if an organization that defined itself as a charity's sole purpose was segregation, they inherently could not be a charitable organization. Well, yeah, obviously. The IRS then decided before going after these segregation academies, they would have to send questionnaires to all of the alleged segregation academies. So who was the first segregation academy they sent their questionnaire to? None other than Bob Jones, to which when filling out the questionnaire to the question, if Bob Jones, the university discriminated on the basis of race, Bob Jones vehemently replied, they do not accept African Americans. Talk about a raggedy rat. So what does this have to do with, hold your horses, we're getting there. Once the IRS and the court ascertained that all of these charities, these private Christian schools were basically just fronts for segregation, they then decided to yank their tax exempt status. They hit them where it hurts, where it matters in America to people, in the pockets. This didn't sit well with the evangelical leaders, specifically Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell went on to become the father of the religious right. So Jerry Falwell, who was an ardent segregationist, had started his own segregation Academy in Lynchburg, Virginia. Yes, the name of the town. 
The school was originally called Lynchburg Christian Academy. It has been embroiled in controversy ever since, even under its new name, Liberty University. True story, when I was in the 11th grade, Liberty University sent me a pamphlet encouraging me to apply. I saw that they were based in Lynchburg, Virginia and took that as a hate crime. I should have reported them. Now the disgruntled evangelical leaders had a bone to pick with the government, who ironically at the time the president during all of this was Democrat Jimmy Carter, who himself was an evangelical and a former Sunday school teacher, but he did not share a lot of the beliefs that the evangelicals did. Insert a one, Paul Weirich. Paul Weirich is the founder of the ultra conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation. And for years he had been searching for an issue to rally the evangelicals around in order to turn them to conservatives and let's be honest and call a spade a spade he wanted the large voting bloc for the republicans by the late 1970s it wasn't in vogue to say the word segregation or to actively say that you were a segregationist even if you were running a segregation academy many of which still exist today yeah we're not ready for that conversation so Paul Weirich in 1976 realized that he could mobilize evangelicals around under the guise of segregation. Evangelical leadership wanted their money for their segregation academies. Paul Weirich wanted his voting bloc. And by 1979, six years after Roe v. Wade and after the two conventions that the Southern Baptist Convention had held, aka the evangelicals, stating they didn't really care about the procedure, all of a sudden, they cared so much that in 1980, they then elected Ronald Reagan, a wealthy former movie star who ran on an anti and conservative American platform. Now that we've gone through the cases that really got us here, back to why language matters. The forest birth movement has given a fake rallying cry to millions of people on the right. Steeped in faux indignation, the overturn of Roe v. Wade and the erosion of healthcare is seen as a huge victory of morality. Never mind that after Roe v. Wade, many of these people who prioritize anti as reason for voting Republican are still poor, attend defunded public schools, and are represented by politicians who ignore their basic requests. The Dems are also ancient ass people, so I'm just going to put that out there. And just because people will argue that they will adopt this new generation of unfortunate children. In part two, we'll discuss a much needed dose of reality on the current state of how America actually treats children. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in part two.